I'm fascinated by words, by what they mean, how they're used, where they come from. When you start digging into word origins and how words have been used over the years, even centuries, you'll find just how weird language can be. For example, the English word cleave can mean both to split and to cling to. If we were to investigate the word and these two different meanings, where they come from, uh, we'd find that this one word actually came from two different words that have uh, evolved over a few hundred years from Old German uh, to Old English to have similar and eventually the same spelling in Modern English. Uh, so the word cleave can mean to split, like a cleaver, and it can mean to cling, uh, like the biblical concept found in Genesis 2, verse 24. Uh, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Yes, that's a quote from the King James Version, but it's interesting to me that while this verse reveals that God's ideal for marriage is for husband and wife to cleave or, or to cling to one another as one flesh, uh, we often call it a split when a marriage ends. No, cleave isn't a word that we use very often, but the imagery is important. It's significant that there are things that cling or adhere together so closely or so tightly as if they are one, that it takes a lot of effort, maybe even a sharp, heavy knife to split them apart. Animal flesh clings to or, or cleaves to the bone. Joints cleave to one another with tendons and sinew. So a butcher might have to use a, a cleaver to cleave or split them apart. In God's plan for marriage, husband and wife are meant to cling to one another, to cleave to each other as one flesh, so that they could be separated only by considerable effort. That it would take something terrible, uh, like abuse or an affair, to cleave them apart. Now, even though God's plan for marriage is meant to endure for a lifetime, uh, even though terrible and traumatic events, we know how common it is for those who essentially vow to, cle uh, to cleave to one another, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, uh, until only death cleaves them apart, that they would split over irreconcilable differences. I don't want to minimize the things that can come between husband and wife, because while they might seem insignificant to us who are on the outside of their marriage, they can become significant, sometimes abruptly, but more often it happens over time. Even the clearly terrible situations like abuse or an affair don't usually happen all at once. They begin slowly and evolve. Abuse can grow out of simple irritations at work that grow into short tempers at home and eventually into an uncontrolled rage. Affairs can grow out of simple interactions that grow into friendships with blurred boundaries that become clearly crossed lines, although crossed in secret. However, even couples who guard the boundaries of their relationships with others can find themselves drifting from one another for other reasons, like professional goals that lead to more and more time apart, or standards of living that produce conflicts over spending and saving. While those conflicts might seem uh, fairly insignificant in the moment, they can become small wedges that lead to big cracks and separation. It's kind of like what happened to the uh, old man of the mountain or the great stone face of New Hampshire. For at least 200 years, probably many more, people noticed how a series of granite cliffs on Cannon Mountain uh, kind of looked like the profile of a person's face. And over the years, with water seeping into the ground and, and the freezing and thawing through many winters, cracks formed and grew. New Hampshire started protecting the rock face in the 1920s, uh, but the cracks kept growing until sometime after midnight on May 3, 2003, the face collapsed. While the collapse happened overnight, the cracks formed and grew slowly over time. Now we've seen similar cracks forming and growing between the people of Israel and God throughout the accounts of the Old Testament book of Numbers. They began slowly with complaints about food and water, but grew into rebellion and sin. 
Those cracks grew until the people rejected God and God's leadership. And God promised that the generation who he led out of slavery in Egypt would not enter the promised land. Now, as bad as that rebellion and its consequences were, the separation between Israel and God became an outright affair with false gods as Israel camped just across the Jordan River in Moab. It says in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 9, While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women, who invited them to, to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. And so Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. And the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, Each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. But those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. Now, even though God had rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt, protected them from their enemies, provided for their needs for 40 years, here they are camping right across the Jordan River from the Promised Land. And yet the people cheated on God. Even though God had established a covenant relationship with them in which God said in Leviticus 26 verse 12, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. It tells us here in Numbers 25 verse 3, Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. Now, once again, Israel's lack of faith and disobedience show us that we need to cling to God in faith. Instead of clinging to God faithfully, Israel allowed itself to be seduced by false gods and not only cheated on God, but yoked themselves to those false gods. They broke faith with God and experienced God's anger and judgment. Israel's life in history was meant to demonstrate a faithful relationship with God, uh, the classic leave and cleave illustration of marriage. But instead, they learned, and they teach us as well, that we need to cling to God in faith because the seduction of sin is a setup, and its outcome is destruction. However, as we continue to follow this account, we can see that God's plan has a remedy. That God pleads with people to be restored to himself through purification by his grace. Now, while the temptation of sin promises pleasures and benefits, the harsh reality is that its seduction is a setup. And that's where this account begins. It says in Numbers 25, verses 1 and 2, that while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to their sacrifices of their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. And here we can see the process. We can see how the people were seduced, how the cracks began to grow. We really don't have to figure out how the men were so easily seduced by the women. It says in verse 1, to indulge in sexual immorality. Now forgive me for being flippant, but sex was easily the gateway drug to worshiping the Canaanite false god Baal. Baal was a fertility god who was supposed to provide bountiful crops, increasing herds and flocks, and large families. And one way people worshipped and served Baal was enacting the actions of fertility through sex. We say it even today, sex sells. And so it was easy to seduce the men of Israel through sex. 
which led them to join in the rituals of sacrificial meals and bowing down to Baal, to the point where they had, it says in verse 3, yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. But it's not just sex that seduces, is it? People are often seduced by, by wealth and success, power and authority, the promise of an easy life. And that seduction doesn't just happen out in the world. It happens in the church as well. There are many people in the church who are seduced by the promise of a good life, some combination of the imagined American dream with a hyper-spiritualized view of heaven on earth. If we only go to church, if we do good deeds, if we vote the right way and be nice to other people. But Paul warned the church in 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 that those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, there are also many people in the church who are seduced by false teachers and false prophets who promote themselves as the interpreters of the signs of the times or as recipients of God's real or secret messages. But Jesus warned in Matthew 24, verse 4, very simply, watch out that no one deceives you. And there are people in the church who are seduced by plans and products and programs that promise to grow the church through busy volunteers and families with jam-packed calendars instead of pursuing Jesus' mission that he explained clearly in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Seduction's been a setup from the very beginning. After the serpent tempted Eve with lies about God, we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, John described that temptation and seduction, writing uh, to the early church in 1 John ver uh, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is the seduction that tempted and led Israel astray. Even if it wasn't all about the seduction of sex, the promise of fertility, which would lead to wealth and prosperity, had to be tempting to these people who had been wandering in the wilderness, uh, eating manna for 40 years. Certainly, we saw the sinful pride of the Israelite man who led the Midianite woman into the camp and into his tent before the whole community and their leaders and God at the tent of meeting. The seduction was a scam. It was a setup. In fact, we learn later on in Numbers that this seduction was instigated by Balaam. We looked at Numbers uh, 22 through 24, when the Israelites defeated the Midianites and Moabites, and the leaders spared uh, the, the Moabite women. Moses told them and later on in Numbers 31, verse 16, that these were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in the Peor incident so that a plague struck the Lord's people. Even though Balaam said, uh, back in Numbers 22, verse 18, that he could not do anything great or small, he said, to go beyond the command of the Lord my God, he had also prompted the Moabites to seduce the Israelites. And so instead of clinging to God in faith, they yoked themselves to Baal, calling down their own curse upon themselves from God. Now, this should emphasize that we must cling to God in faith. Otherwise, destruction is the outcome. Now, Israel didn't merely disobey God and, and earn a spiritual whooping. It says in Numbers 25, verse 3, that Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. In this seduction, Israel let go of God completely. They clung to false gods and exposed themselves to God's righteous anger and judgment. And so in Numbers 25, verse 4, we read that the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel, 
because Israel let loose of God, God let loose on Israel, and 24,000 people died. Now, it's important to notice here that God's initial command of judgment was to kill the leaders of the people. This wasn't just an individual sin problem that somehow ran rampant throughout the community. It was a failure in leadership that prompted the failure among the people. It tells us, Numbers 25, verse 14, that the name of the Israelite who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Salu, the leader of a Simeonite family. Zimri Zimri was a, a leader among the people, but he flouted his leadership before the people, before God, bringing the Midianite woman into the camp and taking her into his tent. Again, there's the pride of life that John described in his letter. And there's where we find the truth of Proverbs 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, here's where we need to pay attention. Whether our sin is the result of uh, falling to seduction and temptation or the kind of prideful arrogance of Zimri, we need to understand that the consequences of our sin are death and destruction. From the beginning, when God told Adam in Genesis 2, verse 17, that he must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. It has been true, uh, what Paul told the church in Romans 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. Where seduction to sin is the, the setup, destruction is the outcome. However, God's judgment by death was not merely punishment of individuals. It was the purification of the nation. While death and destruction are the outcome of sin, purification is the remedy for sin. Notice what happened when Zimri led the Midianite woman through the assembly. It says in Numbers 25, verses 7 and 8, that when Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly took a spear in his hand, and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. Yeah, the consequences for the people's sin were death and destruction, and, and Zimri and the woman both received the penalty for their sin, and they died. However, upon their deaths... It says the plague of judgment against Israel ended. Phineas' actions were not merely an execution, but a sacrifice. As a priest, the grandson of Aaron, Phineas paid the debt of the people's sins with the blood of the sinners. While the wages of sin is death, so is the remedy of sin, death, for purification. This is the foundation of the sacrificial system uh, Israel had received at Mount Sinai 40 years ago, which we find explained uh, in the New Testament in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 22. It says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. And God himself explained that this was a sacrifice. It says in Numbers 25, verses 10 through 13, that the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites. Since he was as zealous for my honor among them as I am, I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore, tell him I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Now, when God said that Phinehas was zealous for God's honor, he wasn't simply impressed that Phinehas somehow just stood up for God. God was honored because Phinehas was zealous for God's holiness. Remember, Holy God was living among the Israelites in the middle of their camp. His presence was revealed in the pillar of cloud and fire that rested over the tabernacle and that led the people through the wilderness. Because Holy God was among the people, Phineas honored God's holiness by purifying the camp of the idolatry and sexual immorality of Zimri and all those who had yoked themselves to Baal. 
Now, folks, because we are also seduced by sin and subject to the destruction of God's holy, righteous judgment, we also need to be purified of sin. Church, this is true for us as well. Paul taught the church uh, this about idolatry and sexual immorality in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. He said, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? And Paul went on, reminding the church of God's desire to dwell within and among us. Quoting Leviticus, Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, that we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. And then Paul challenged the church. In 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, he said, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Now there's that idea of leave and cleave. Leave behind the seduction of the world and cleave to God. Separate ourselves from sin and sinful desires and cling to God in faith. Just as Phineas purified the camp and honored God, so must we purify ourselves, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone needs killing to deal with our sins. That sacrifice has already been made by Jesus. However, we need to live like we've been purified from sin. Again, John told the early church in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Through Jesus' sacrifice, the debt's been paid. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been purified by God. Now we just need to live like it. And God made that possible for Israel through Phineas' actions as well. Uh, pay attention to what God said in Numbers 25, verses 12 and 13. He says, Tell him, I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Because Phineas purified the camp, honoring God's holiness and making atonement for Israel's sins, God established a covenant of peace with Phineas and his family, promising them that they would have a lasting priesthood. So not only was the plague stopped, but this leader of God's people had been blessed with the promise of peace and given a lifelong opportunity to serve God, leading God's people to cling to God faithfully. And here we see God's desires to dwell among his people confirmed, restored, even though Israel had once again rejected God and yoked themselves to Baal through Phineas's actions, God had made atonement for them, enabling them to cling to God faithfully. And in this, we can see that restoration is the plea. Now again, pay attention to what God said about Phineas and his actions in Numbers 25, verse 11. It said, Phineas, son of Eleazar, the, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, since he was as je or zealous for my honor among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. It was because of Phineas' sacrifices that God turned away his anger. Because of Phineas' zeal for God's holiness, God did not destroy Israel, but restored them. Now, folks, this is how we can find strength in numbers, how we can find the good news in numbers. Israel didn't simply disobey God. They yoked themselves to Baal, a false god. While holy God judged Israel and they experienced the consequences of their sin, death, and destruction, God relented when Phineas the priest honored God's holiness and purified the camp. When God stopped the plague and established this covenant of peace with Phineas and his family, we see God's grace in action. We see forgiveness. We find peace. We see restoration. That was God's plea to Israel. And it continues to be God's plea today. The fact is, we're no different from Israel. Israel. 
Even we who have responded to God's plea, we who have been forgiven through faith in Jesus, still fall to the seduction and temptation of sin in the world, sin in our flesh, sin in our hearts and minds. And because of that sin, we know that death and destruction is the outcome. And so we need to repent and turn to God for forgiveness and restoration because of God's holiness and power. Because of God's love and grace, he has provided for our purification, for our forgiveness of sin through Jesus' sacrifice. And just as Phineas, the priest, pierced the sinning man and woman, turning away God's judgment, Jesus, the great high priest, allowed his own body to be pierced for our sins. Fulfilling the promise of uh, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, verse 5, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is the good news of restoration. Reconciliation with God through Jesus. Uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20, that all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now that's my invitation to you. Are you still struggling with the seduction and temptation of sin in your life? Are you still facing the, the consequences of that sin? Death, destruction, eternal separation from God? Then you need the remedy that God offers. Purification of sin through Jesus. Now God offers the opportunity for restoration. The question is, will you accept it? Well, you can accept it when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life. When you repent, turning away from your old sinful life and turning back to God for new life. When you confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life. And when you join with Jesus by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, when you do that, you'll be forgiven. You'll be purified, justified before God. And God, the Holy Spirit, will come and live within you to help you live this new life, clinging to God in faith until Jesus returns. Now, if you're ready to make that decision or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we might get together and work through all of that as soon as possible. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father God, I confess that I'm a sinner, uh, often seduced by temptation of sin. Uh, but God, I'm eternally grateful that you sent Jesus, who died on the cross to forgive my sins, and who you raised again so that we might have new life through faith in Jesus. Thank you, Father, for, for purifying me of my sin and for offering your grace and restoration through Jesus. And God, I pray right now for those who need to put their faith in Jesus, uh, to receive your grace and forgiveness, uh, to be restored to you uh, with new life. Father, lead them to yourself by your Holy Spirit, through your word, uh, and with the help of your people, the church. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.